Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Lorna Schumann. I'm an educator at the Illinois State Museum, and we are so thankful that you could join us tonight for this program called Exploring Foods Asian Style. It's in celebration of the Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, and we are excited to have our guest speaker with us tonight. And now, I would like to introduce Chef Michael Maddox of the Culinary Arts School at the College of DuPage. Food is a great way to explore different cultures, and Chef Michael will take us on a culinary journey exploring foods of Asia and the Pacific Islands with three different dishes. So Michael, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Uh, my pleasure to be here with you this evening. Um, so tonight's kind of, I'm excited about this month, you know, being the uh, Asian Pacific American uh, Heritage Month. And so I kind of a PowerPoint, and then we're gonna watch a, like a cooked culinary demo that uh, we shot with my wife, who's also a chef, Chef Susan Maddox. So I'm gonna kind of jump with that, share my screen here, and I'm gonna jump to that real quick so we can take a look at that. And so here I kind of kind of started with that, and as Lorna touched on those things as well, to so we get this up here properly. One second. There we go. So as we look, we're kind of celebrating this month, and it's a huge area, right? Huge, huge area that we have uh, as we look at that Asian, uh, Asian American Pacific Islander region. And so it kind of this is kind of a nice little synopsis of that. But I'm kind of to, uh, making three different recipes tonight. Uh, one is a vegetable maki roll. One is a Vietnamese uh, beef noodle soup, a pho. And then finally, a Philippine style chicken and broccoli barbecue bowl, because bowls are very popular right now. And to me, it's it's a lot of different components coming together, celebrating the cuisine, the ingredients, and all those items from that. So the PowerPoint kind of relates to those ingredients that we're using, and just I'll kind of zip through this a little bit, but I'd take a good look at what's going on. So History, culture, we can move this, we can move this out of the way real quick, or maybe not. Um, so history and the culture and the traditions with that. And so we look at those, you know, as, as people in general, we're very social lifestyle. And we look at the, you know, Asian Pacific Islander Americans, but, you know, very social lifestyle, all of us. And we need other people. We've, we've been through COVID and are going through COVID the last couple few years like that. And we see that, that we like that human interaction. This is kind of the same thing with people all over the world. And so I kind of have a couple items up there and we see how, and, and on all cultures, right? No matter where you come from or friends or family and those kind of things, but we see how customs and traditions and you know passed on generation, generation and, and, and recipes from heritage. And I kind of put up there as well, traditional music and dance and food and cuisine and, and also holidays, right? Coming together. Um, cultural storytelling, music, dance, all those things have been passed from generation to generation. And I think it's important, um, no matter what, where, what, what your background is per se, but sharing those stories, sharing those moments and sharing those life experiences with, with your family members and, generate, and younger family members and all those kind of things too. I think it's important to pass that along. And I kind of put there at the bottom one there, it says cuisine is extremely important. Cultures and family generational recipes are handed down and taught sharing the pride and the love for the family and the dishes and how many celebrations include specific great savory and sweet desserts. But I think it's great with any and these people and, and this, this culture are very, very into that. And I think it's wonderful um, just sharing their knowledge of cuisine and culture and heritage with that traditions too. So as we look at that, let's see if we can get going, here we go. Um, so let's look at some important ingredients and dishes. And so rice is one of the one things we look at, and this is a medium grain that we see a lot of this. And for Pacific Islands account for about 90% of the rice that we use. Now we look at long grain rice. So if you make rice peel off and different dishes, medium grain rice, about 90% of what's consumed there, uh, non-glutinous, so not a sticky rice, but kind of medium in length. And when I cook, it's be soft and sticks together, ideal for sushi, rice bowls, risotto, right? We see the Oreo uh, rice and different types of rices for risotto. Risotto is more of a style. It's like peel off is a style as well. So medium grain rice is a popular one. And then we also, as we continue that, the short grain rice, right? And so we different one, different ones. And these kernels are short and round and cook soft and sticky. Um, we see this a lot and we're gonna kind of look at that. When we look into um, sushi preparations, 
as far as cooling it down and the equipment that we use with this. But this is kind of a the great variety of the short grain rice that we see a lot with uh, with this wonderful culture. And then as we continue on, the third type we see, let's see if we can catch up here with the screen. Oops, let me go back here one. Sorry about that, my apologies. So sweet rice, why we see this a lot more on the, on the, on the sweet side per se, and very glutinous variety, very opaque in color. Uh, cook, it has a sweet rice, becomes very sticky and a slightly sweet taste. Ideal for mixing, very good for uh, mixing and sticking together and making different uh, different uh, pastries and sweets for that because of the stickiness property. Uh, used a lot, most commonly in desserts. So something like you see this a lot, um, there's quite a few um, as ethnic grocery stores near where I live. And so we'll see these even like those, as we see, as you go to regular grocery stores, you have all kinds of candies and that kind of stuff when you're checking out for that uh, impulse buying. The same thing in a lot, many great ethnic uh, grocery stores as well. They'll have these wonderful little sweet treats there as you're going out. And uh, it's pretty, pretty neat to have those. And also I always make a point as a chef by, by trade per se, is I like trying different ingredients and different foods and these kind of things. And so myself and my wife and when my adult children are home, we're called the guinea pigs, right? So we eat, we'll eat those different things, try those different things in different cultures and different, um, different people, which is great. And then we look at sushi as equipment, tools, types, terminology, uh, those kind of items like that. So in, for sushi began in China and Southeast Asia, right around 500 BC, disappeared in China after the Mongols. And then religion moved sushi to Japan. And so as a preservation method, when it started like that, and so we think about preservation, right? What does that do? It increases the lifelong. So we think about shelf stable. We think about, you know, why we preserve. Nowadays, like I talk with my students at the College of DuPage, we say we preserve because we want to, not because we have to. And I think that's interesting because of whether you're canning or you're smoking or you're curing, all these different things are preserving freezer, those things as well. But it's enjoyment from it, right? So, you know, you're getting ingredients that are at the peak of flavor and you're utilizing those. Myself, I come from central Illinois and from a farm down there. And so my parents, we raised animals and we had uh, uh, different uh, soybeans and corn and wheat, and all these kind of things, chickens, cows, pigs, all that kind of stuff. But we also had quite a few fruit trees and grapes and stuff like that. And so when those pears were ripe or those apples were ripe or those grand crab, crab apples were ripe, we would preserve those. And it could be vanilla pears. It could be pear preserves, could be pear jelly, crab apple jelly, things like that. So along the same line. So with these earthenware vessels were used and they were actually would pack layers of rice with that fish and it was put in a cool place, kind of what, what you do with kimchi. Uh, what, in my, one of my colonology classes currently, we're making a fermented green hot sauce and we're also making kimchi, a, a, a pickled cabbage or fermented cabbage really is what that is. So, but it, it, with the rice and the fish is they would layer rice with the fish, layer that up, put it in these urns cool place and allow it to ferment. And at that point back then in history is that actually would take that out after that fish had been fermented and shelf stable and lifelong, that they would actually eat the fish and discard the rice, right? Uh, when that, that dish was brought to Japan, the rice began to be eaten along with that fish. And we also see a, a great, great amount of fish sauces that occurred, right? We saw that through history. Um, the love of people enjoying fish sauces. Think about Lee and Perrin's Worcestershire sauce, right? So how that was, right? That the story of that was pretty interesting because as it was a rage year, you know, hundreds of years ago when those fish sauces were popular or those fermented sauces were popular and Lee and Perrin's were in England and they had this, they had made this, this barrel of this fermented this Worcestershire sauce. Now is what it is, but it was so strong. They put it down their basement because they were chemists by trade and and they put down the basement, they were doing some work seven, eight, nine years later, and they found this barrel and then they tasted it and this, it had smoothed out, right? The strength, it was, the flavor was still there, but it wasn't nearly as pungent and strong. And it was very pleasing as a taste. And from that, they noticed that we see that with Tabasco and other hot sauces, other fermented sauces, by allowing that mash to, to, to work and ferment and then adding equal parts of vinegar to that, you know, or in different type flavored vinegars as well but how that flavor really comes through that. So that from a preservation method to actually eating the rice with the fish. As we look at the evolution of that as well, and some terminology that we use as well for that, we can see the sushi is rice with vinegar. Sashimi, right, we see that word all term a lot. It's actually the, the raw, or, raw or cooked fish that's sliced very thinly. It's actually served without fish. So fish without, I'm sorry, without rice. 
And then we have another one with fish, with rice, with a combination of that. And then what's interesting is when he's first started the, these street carts, like how we see carts and we see different food trucks, right? Food trucks nowadays. But years and years ago in this country and other countries as well, and in, in, in Asia and also Pacific Islanders, right? They had these sushi carts and they hang hanging curtains for shade and people were using those for napkins. And I, I think it's kind of a cute little interesting fact, the more sushi that that cart sold, the dirtier the napkins. So that meant the better the cart, right? The better the food, the better quality of food of that as well. And then the World War II caused the introduction of the sushi restaurants and it became the number one restaurant in Japan uh, due to that. But I always thought that dirtier than napkin thing, not the most sanitation thing, sanitary thing, but, uh, but you know where the good food is, right? They always talk about that great hole in the wall restaurant with great food. So I think it's kind of interesting the evolution. Equipment. Um, with we see this, right? We kind of look at the different items like this, and you don't have to have these items, but that knife is a picture of a knife there, but you know, it's angled on one side. It's designed to pull when you cut that. So we all talk about knife safety in this uh, in the culinary video we're gonna show you here, but it's long enough to cut through with cutting, whether it be in cutting fish and cutting other products, but it's just a beautiful knife like that. Uh, the wooden bowl is used, it's porous, so absorbs, absorbs the moisture. So once you've steamed that rice, you'll actually put that in there with the wooden paddle. A lot of times, interestingly, you actually use a fan and you would act gently moving the rice around without smashing or smashing those grains of rice. You would actually gently move that around, adding some vinegar to that. And you're actually trying to cool that very rapidly. And because that porous wood absorbs the moisture, that'll help draw that out and allows more surface space to cool quickly. And so you have a nice sticky rice, even, even with a nice seasoned vinegar flavor uh, for that. And so then I have a bamboo rolling mat uh, as well, and the wooden paddle. I believe I talk about this, the mat on the bottom, a trick that, you know, we can roll that right in that, that traditional uh, rolling mat. I will say when you see the video with me rolling that is I'd like to take that and put it inside a plastic wrap and then put it again, like, so two layers of plastic wrap, I roll that in so it's nice and tight. A, it stays very clean and sanitary. I can still put the nori or the toasted seaweed on that and still roll it up really tight. It's just those things, I'm just with germs and if you try to clean it, is it clean properly and all those kind of things. So it's a good, it's not so great for show per se, but for sanitation reasons, I like to put that in a couple layers of plastic. Uh, if you go to different um, different Asian restaurants and those kind of things, may then not, may not utilize that. But personally, as a chef, I like to use that you know, production wise. I think it's a great thing to do and also sanitation as well as we look at that. Then different terminologies, right? So sushi really means it is sour, right? A vinegar rice for that. And then we have uh, tazu, which is vinegar, a weak solution. So when you're going to see me later on, I'm rolling the, the rolling the log out of that is I have a little solution of some water. I have a little bit of vinegar and some salt in that. So I use that to moisten my hands so the rice doesn't stick to that, as well as you can also use that to wipe your knife off and those kind of items too. So that, that knife, when you're cutting those logs or cutting that, it's not going to stick to it. So that, that's a nice, a very weak solution of water, vinegar, and salt. Um, so shimu, we missed that. Translated means pierced fish. But again, that's the fish without the rice, normally cooked or raw um, quality of that. Uh, the maki is what I'm kind of doing. They the, call it makushi, or they also call it the California roll. It's, in essence, a rolled sushi with nori and vegetables. That, and that's what we're doing this evening for the demonstration. But with that demo I'm doing, or I did, is you can put different, uh, different yellowfin tuna in there. You could put cooked shrimp, different things. There's even um, imitation crab leg. I mean, it depends on how far, how much you wish to spend on that, but there's some great things to look at. Um, Tamaki is kind of a hand and, uh, which means hand and maki is roll. So it's kind of a hand rolled sushi, kind of like a cone. And you actually take the nori and you'll put the filling inside of it. So it's very hand friendly, easy to eat with those hand type of foods as well. And then finally, another one, it's it, this shashimi, shashimi is kind of similar. We have like talk about the bowl, right? And so bowls are popular and you put the rice and you scatter assorted things over it. That's kind of what that is as well. A lot, mostly a deep, uh, deep pan or deep dish per se with the rice on the bottom. And they put different types of seafood and shellfish and vegetables as well on that. So different uses with that. And then other terms we look at and Another shapes that you may have seen. So you see these with the, the mothership translated uh, battleship. Uh, maki is a traditional sushi consisting of a ball of rice wrapped in seaweed, or in this case, smoked salmon, and topped with some beautiful fish roll. A lot of times you'll see that with salmon roll on top of it. And then also the uh, securing that with a thin piece of nori is the second one that I translated as a seat belt, but kind of a strip um, and like a sash, right? right? On, a, um, on, a, on a Japanese or Asian robe like that as well. Tea towels, right? The same thing as kind of 
uh, omelet. We'll feed those with the rice enclosed in a thin omelet, an egg omelet. And then finally, a steamed sushi served pot. A lot of times we'll see that sometimes with mussels. So not the end all as far as terminology, but just little things, with some little tidbits I think are kind of interesting as you have some fun at home with your family and friends. We like to make these kind of dishes that I'm demoing because we can really get uh, friends over or neighbors come over and we cook together. And I'm sure at most of your houses, if you entertain with family and friends, a lot of things are people are brought together when it comes to food, ingredients, and cuisine. And a lot of times people end up in the kitchen and working together or finishing dishes together. So I think it's kind of fun. So I just kind of have some quick little things. I did send this as well. I'm, I think that Lorna will probably have to make that available as well, the PowerPoint, but just some little things about um, how to make those and why we look at those in different styles or types of that. And we have the Saka style sushi. And I have some kind of different variations down below as well as we look at those. But you know, using cooked ingredients as grilled sea eel, egg omelet, simmered dry tofu. So just some different great information there for you as well um, as we look at these. And then another one is the Kyoto. Kyoto. And in Japan, so depending on the fresh fish. And then so these, you know, this kind of things are is difficult because this is more inland Japan and difficult to get the fresh fish. So they're using more cured, um, just like other countries, right? You're making uh, grav locks or locks, right, from the belly of the salmon. So very similar to this as well, using different types of fish uh, to make this wonderful sushi as well. You can see the different types there. So kind of a fun little information for that second type one. Then we also have one as well using um, more South Central uh, Japan, and this is a pressing sushi with using cured salmon or mackerel wrapped in persimmon leaves. And, you know, for health-wise, persimmon leaves are known to have antibacterial properties. Uh, sometimes they are salted to increase the effects of that. So you get a lot of good flavor as well as the cured salmon and or mackerel with that too. And then we also have another one in more than northern, right? Just as you think about, you know, not just, uh, you know, Asia and Pacific Island, but think about in this country and other countries too, as far as regional cooking, regional cuisine, ingredients that you have in that area and you're cooking and you're using things that will grow that you can produce. Um, this week in one of my classes, we talked about hydrocolloids. We talked about how we use thickeners and in the Midwest, we use a lot of arrowroot cornstarch and ruse and, and things like this. But other parts of the world, they've actually extracted items out of seaweed. If you look at carrageen, you look at uh, xanthan gum, you look at gar gum and different things, different products used as thickeners. And for us, to a certain degree, we're not used to those as much as other cultures, other countries, but you, you use what is grown around you, what you can produce. So I think it's kind of interesting as you look at the different cuisines from all those different areas that we look at the Asian and Pacific Islander location, what can you grow? What do you have available? What do we do? And what's passed on from generation to generation? We see some more examples of this here as well as we look at those things. And then our last one, of course, is the final one. And we're looking at different ingredients, right, for those tofu pouches and I don't go back there real quick, tofu pouches and for that as well. And then I kind of put a couple of different types of seafood types on there as well, uh, things that we see again, what is grown, what is near you, what can you produce? And we look at that same thing in the Midwest or we look at that in uh, different parts of the world as well. And I think that's great, and especially you know, with Illinois and other other states around here, it's, it's such a beautiful melting pot. And, and Lorna, we're, we're talking before this program started, is what it's amazing that what you can find at grocery stores nowadays, and the availability from transportation and refrigeration, and getting products from other parts of the world. And if you're someone who's new to this country or just new to different areas, it's kind of a comfort thing, right? If you ever go on vacation or go someplace in another country and you're exploring. But sometimes you still want that little bit of comfort food of home and something that you enjoy. I think it's the same thing. And to me, there's a couple of grocery stores near where I live. And it's, to me, it's, it's very interesting to see the things that they're selling and what's there. And to me, that's part of exploring as a chef. I love it because I love working with different ingredients and using traditional or different types of cooking methods and techniques and utilizing that product in different ways. And so I think that nowadays what the grocery stores have and different ethnic ingredients and even finished products as well is pretty amazing as well with that. And we look at the pho cuisine, right? So we're looking at that and considered to be the national dish of the Vietnamese or back to the late, late 19th century. And we see that no, more and more. Um, traditionally made with chicken or beef broth, spiced with array of flavors and topped with herbs. Pho has gone through 
to capture the attention of the Western world with given its complex characteristics. And we even take that into seafood and more vegetarian as well, right? There's a lot of fun things you can do with that. Um, the one I'm doing for my demonstration is a beef one as well, but we can look at the most two most common I put here is using the beef. And what's kind of a little note there is if you look down, this is normally the, the beef used in Fabo is medium rare, continues to cook in the steaming soup broth. You're going to see me with very thinly cut meat. I put that in that broth, add the broth, and in that broth, it actually starts to cook that. So it's very thin, so it cooks very quickly. Beef options include flank steak, and I put crunchy flank steak, and really tendons, meatballs, and fatty brisket. And the crunchy flank steak, well, what is that, fried or what's going on? No, actually, it is actually where the elastic, elastin, um, the connective tissue actually left on there, right? For certain cultures, they like that chewiness. So even though you slice it right then, you don't remove the silver skin. Just like if you have a pork tenderloin or a beef tenderloin or some like silver, they call it silver skin as well. Um, that actually, we, uh, most Americans to a certain degree, don't like that we take that off, remove that because uh, it was kind of a chewy or bitier kind of a situation. But in other, in other cultures and countries, they actually like that chewiness of that, that of that. So not like crunchy, like we think of crunchy potato chips, but this is where the silver skin is only removed on the one side and the other side still has that in there. So it provides kind of a chewy like tendons, right? So more of a muscles of movement compared to muscles of support. And that kind of leans into how you prepare things in general. The chicken one as well, pretty straightforward as well. More of the broth, you see some different ingredients there that we use. Condiments for that, right, is chili sauce, lime, Poison sauce, right, which is a great one too, and making that and or buying that. Uh, the recipes that we have for tonight are some complex ones, but things you can do, some little cheaters as well as we go through that. And then I kind of put many, many variations, but I put the most popular ones are the beef and the chicken as well. So I put three fun recipes to prepare and enjoy this month and make them a family favorites by stepping outside of one's comfort zone. So if you cook a lot of ethnic cuisine, awesome, great. I hope this can add to it. If you don't, take a look and perhaps think about perhaps trying one of these and doing that. Let's see if we can. Good evening, greetings, and welcome. My name is Chef Michael Maddox, and we're going to be celebrating Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. This month of May is a great month. Uh, we're going to make some great food. It's such a huge area to cover and to talk about. But I thought tonight would be kind of fun to make three different recipes. I'm making a great little appetizer, like a little bit of a, a maki uh, sushi roll, vegetarian, with a raspberry dipping sauce. And then we're going to make a bowl. We have a great little chicken and barbecue bowl, since bowls are popular right now. So I think it's a great, a ton of different flavors and textures to try. And then finally, we're going to make a little pho, a little beef pho, which I think is going to be very tasty. So you got a broth with a, for, a bowl, for a soup, and you have a wonderful bowl, and we got a nice appetizer. So a lot of stuff to do. Uh, my wife, Chef Susie Maddox, also be kind of helping me out in the kitchen here, getting things organized as we make all this great cuisine, celebrating the month. And, you know, the idea of such a such a great area and such, when you look at those countries, the culture, the, the personality, the history, all those different things, ingredients that they grow and that they have and that they make really play good, a huge influence on the cuisine that they eat. And so we're going to take some of that tonight. So I have some chicken here, some chicken thighs. Um, that I went ahead and I took the skin off. So they're boneless skin, the skinless thighs. I'm going to put them in the bag here just for sanitation purposes uh, because we need to marinate that for a little bit. We're going to push this a little bit. I do have some that's already marinated. Let's go ahead and sneak that in there real quick. So let's put that in the bag just for sanitation and everything. So these have just been skinned, uh, have been boned, and got all set up. Let's put that over there. So those are in there. I'm going to go ahead and drop it in. I'm going to wash my hands real quick. And so we're going to take that. We need to get that marinated. So we can marinate that for a couple hours or even overnight. would be wonderful. Can I have a towel, please? Thank you. So we're going to get that marinated. And so the marinade for this is pretty good. It's a banana ketchup. This you can buy. Uh, you can also make it. But this is like using banana, black bananas that you pureed. Got a few other ingredients in there. We actually make our own homemade banana ketchup. But you can also buy that. So we're going to put some of that in there. We also have, it calls for 7-Up or a Sprite, some kind of little little carbonated uh, soda like that. That sugar is a lot of work with that too. It helps give some nice flavor. So we're going to put some of that in there. About a cup is what we're talking about. Or else what's neat about this is we're actually going to use the marinade as well as for part of the sauce for that too. So we have that. Uh, a little bit of fresh lemon juice we have there as well. 
We also have some great little white sugarcane vinegar. So it's a little different than distilled vinegar. It's a sugarcane vinegar. The flavor is just a little bit different, very common to that area, of course, over there. Uh, we have a little bit of brown sugar. This is light brown sugar. You could use a dark brown sugar as well. Remember, the, the less refined that sugar is, the more flavor of molasses, per se, comes out of that, too. So we can put that in there as well. We'll mix that up. And then we also have a little touch of uh, soy sauce in there as well. So a lot of good flavors. Think about the sweetness and the sour and the bitter and the umami, right, from the chicken thighs and everything, too, and the soy. And then I have a little garlic. Let's go and move this out of the way. So I have some garlic cloves. I'm going to go and take the garlic cloves. And we call for those recipe being minced. So I'm going to take my chef knife. And I have a towel uh, under the cutting board so it doesn't move. For a chef knife, I'm holding that on one side with my thumb, the other side with index finger to hold it much more control. A lot of people like this, but we feel like this is a lot better. Uh, myself and my wife, uh, Chef Maddox, is our chef instructors at the College of DuPage in Glen Ellen, Illinois. And so we teach those different knife safety skills. So I have the garlic. I'm going to cut the little bit of the top of that uh, clove off because it has kind of the only ones eat that kind of woody part that kind of holds it together on the bulb. And we're going to take them and mince it. So I'm just going to take my knife flat, safely, smash it with the back of my hand, like so. You can see how easy that is. And then to mince it, I'm just going to kind of think about a pyramid or a triangle and just kind of go back and forth, keeping the heel of my hand down as I'm mincing that up. So I don't want to go super, super fine because it can, it can cause that garlic to be bitter. So beautiful. There we go. Take that. We can put it right in our bag here. So here we have that there. I'm going to go ahead and seal that. And I could, you know, if I have a, like a whole, like a seal meal kind of a thing or a vacuum packer, I could put that into as well. But a Ziploc bag works really, really, really well. You can take it and kind of take out some of that air so all that's in there is just the product. And make sure it's nice and closed. And then move that around. Let that marinate. So just beautiful. Susan, you can take that get that going for us? Yes. Thank you so much. It's almost like shake and bake. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So in the meantime, we're going to get out a couple of things going on. But for that same recipe... I'm going to go ahead and prep all the veg so that way the meat is going to be marinating. Um, I have the rice going to be already be taken care of for that to make our stir fried rice with that. So for our vegetables, uh, I already have some peas already ready. I'm going to set those in there for right now. Now the broccoli, let's talk about the broccoli. In the recipe, we talk about having that blanched, right? So the green peas, we took a pot of water, salted the water, brought that to a boil, and I put the peas in there for maybe about 10 seconds just to kind of refresh them and make them nice and bright. Then we took the broccoli. And we blanch as well. Now, if we keep that raw and we cook it from the raw state of when we're making our mixture, it looks okay. But just look what that does. About, we did about probably about a minute or so in some salted blanched water. So we could take it apart, the florets, and blanch individually, or take that whole little bunch and put it in that water as well. Salted water and just cook it till it's knife tender. But you can see eye appealing. The, one, the blanched one gives much more eye appeal and more wanting to be eaten, per se. So beautiful broccoli blanched. And then we have some carrots there as well. So for the carrots, um, we're talking about cutting down the bias. So same thing, I'm going to take that carrot. I'm going to cut it down the middle. So now I have two halves. I'm going to go ahead and take one at a time. I'm going to cut it like about a quarter inch bias, so on an angle cut, per se. So we're going to take that knife. You can see I'm going to have my one hand back. I'm just slicing that really, really easy, just cutting that on a nice little bias as we do about a quarter inch. Let's do one more. Again, my fingers are not like this, but they're tucked back and just nice and easy. And you can see just a oh, nice rocking motion. I like that kind of slice because the knife was always on the cutting board and no chance of hopefully cutting my hand. Also, a good thing to have is a little bowl scraper. That way we can pick this up and put it right when you're going to be cooking something, which is wonderful as well. We also have some scallions. Now, for you, it's up to you. It depends on the size of the pepper. I'm going to cut these into strips, right? So, real nice. So, we can go ahead and cut that pepper down. We've already taken the inside of that out and cleaned it up. I'm going to take a little more out right there. And so, think about bite size. I'm probably going to cut it in half one more time. And when I'm cutting a pepper, if your knife isn't very sharp, you always want to have the skin side down, okay? So, lay it flat. I'm just going to cut some nice, beautiful strips. When you're cutting those, Really push that knife through so it doesn't doesn't so it cuts clean. Because if I just go straight up and down, it may not cut the skin. I'm sure you've cut celery before, and if you don't cut all the way through it, that celery kind of still sticks together. So some nice little strips here. Cut that one in half. We can take a little more of that center out if you want to lay that flat, and then lay that down. And here we go. About the same thickness, quarter inch or so thick. 
You have some beautiful little strips when you're done with that. Let's bring this one over. Same thing. Get that going. Perfect. I'm going to turn my water on here as well. Oops, that is one. Okay, so there's our peppers. And then finally I'm going to cut some scallions for this as well. And what we're going to do is kind of get all this set up because I need to get some rice noodles, or I'll call those rice sticks in this case. Um, I'm going to go ahead and utilize those because we're going to get those cooking. So I'm actually going to get them steeping in the hot water. Okay, so scallions, the same thing, scallions are green onions. I'm going to cut right down them, and the same thing, that nice little bias cut. So nice and beautiful. And I'm to the green part, now I'm going into the white part. And you can see these have all been washed and rinsed and everything. Let's get rid of that one, and then come right down. And what's nice, the reason I leave those roots on, so I can hold on to those as I come down. And when you're done, you have a beautiful sliced... Uh, slice little scallions like that. I'm going to go like this as well. So we'll put those on there. I'm going to save a couple. I may have a couple ideas later for that. We can have some fun with that. But that's our vegetables ready. So chicken is marinating. And I can go ahead and take a peek at that. So chicken is marinating. And we have our vegetables ready to go. We're going to, our rice has already been cooked. So we're doing like a stir fried rice. And at the end, we're going to practice your over easy egg. We're going to put a little egg on top. So Susan, if I can hand that to you real quick. And, and everybody, look how beautiful this is. So we have that all set. So now Michael can go ahead and be ready for a stir fry. So our water is just about to boil. I'm going to put another pan on here real quick. And I'm going to go ahead and start to work on our broth for our pho, right? So we need a nice little broth. So Different ways to do it. We could take the onions, we need to get those brulee. we're going to toast off our spices, but I'm going to take the onion, and so we can put them in the, in the oven in the broiler, just like we'll take a piece of the ginger, and take a little piece off, I'm going to cut this, in. now we're going to, we're going to use ginger in other applications, rather than peeling it or using a, using a knife, we like to use a spoon, so it works really nice, but in this case, we're looking to add, making a broth out of this, so I'm just going to take a little piece off there, I'm going to cut it in a few slices because we're going to brown it in our pan. So, I got a pan heating up here. Onion, we peel the onion, we cut it this way. And so, in France or in, in this country too, they'll call this an onion brulee. So, we're actually going to caramelize the natural sugar and onion, and it's going to give flavor to this. So, let's go ahead and put just a little oil. You can probably hear that pan starting to season. I'm going to put a little oil in there as well. And we'll put our ginger in there. I'll show that to you in just a few minutes. Probably gonna have to get a pair of tongs out, I think, to let's cut one more little piece of ginger. So I can kind of show you what's going on there. Okay. Oh, so. it's gonna smell great, you guys. Alright, my water's cool boil. So I'm gonna go ahead and take this water off. And I'm gonna put have the rice noodles here in the bowl. And Michael, what are those rice noodles for? So these are gonna. This is gonna be for our uh, for our broth, for our saw that we're making. So we're gonna go ahead and get those going. And I want to go ahead and cook those rice noodles. And these are we say cooking, but really it's just gonna come. Uh, we brought that to a boil. I'm gonna make kind of push that in there a little bit. And could you please just cover this so it's just the hot water. We also could cook that in a broth or a stock. But we just want to kind of get that going like that. Since the noodles are so thin, they're going to cook very quickly. Kind of a no-boil method because that water's brought to a boil. We can also use a broth. If, you know, if it's a chicken dish, a chicken broth, or a vegetable broth, and use that rather than plain water. But it's going to cook those noodles um, as it sits there. So that's kind of a nice little no-boil thing. So in the pan for the pho, we need to make that broth. So if you look at our recipe here, right, we have our onion, we have our ginger working. You can smell it, start to make some action here. So the pan is on, right? There's a little bit of heat going there. The pan is dry, but it's on. I'm going to go ahead and add my three pieces of star anise. We have some beautiful cloves we're going to put in there as well. Uh, I have a few cinnamon sticks, a little bit of cardamom. Ooh, smells wonderful. I remember just toasting this. Some whole coriander seeds, okay? So we have that going there, which is great. We don't let that toast. It gets a good flavor. We can smell that starting to work there as well. So we want to get that all kind of set up, get that broth going. I'm going to flip that ginger in just a second, and we'll take a look at that. So let's take a look here while well, that's toasting. And if you're using a store-bought stock, oh, yum. Look how great that looks. 
If you're using a store-bought stock, please make sure that you have unsalted or lower sodium. So this is a lot of method when you any kind of a lot of Asian and Pacific American cuisines and other cuisines as well. A lot of times when you're doing any kind of spice blends and spice, you're going to toast some sp spices, things like this. You want to go ahead and do it individually like this and then put together and you'll blend it. So just in case you open that container of spices up and it's not very strong, you could put it in your saute pan or your pot wherever you're going to be cooking everything else in. You could do it that way. This is just a nice way to toast those things to get them opened up, get some good action going. And so I'm going to go ahead and add a little bit of broth to that now while my other stuff finishes. And again, you can hear that. With Michael adding this, we are using a beef stock. You can use a beef broth. You can use a beef stock. The great thing is we could also make this vegetarian because our noodles are... Um, uh, cooking in our bowl, we could still ginger, get our ginger toasted. See your at, onion, it's beautiful. Can Ooh, you look. see that again, Michael? You're too fast for me. Oh, there we go. I'm going to shut you. this off. Perfect, and the ginger is gorgeous. So we can also do that in the oven, in an oven, in a broiler. But this is really nice because it's now we're going to let that kind of work, let those flavors melt. So this is for our pho, this is our broth. Now if we're doing a chicken pho, right, those kind of things are, you could use a chicken broth or a chicken stock. If you're doing a vegetarian version, then of course you could use a little vegetable stock or vegetable base and those kind of things too. Kind of, kind of have your liquid or your broth match the type of pho that you're making. So it looks good just like that. So I'm going to let that sit for a few minutes. We have some garnish. You may like the garnishes. We have some bean, uh, bean thread there. Uh, we have a little cilantro. I have some chilies. We have a few more scallions. Maybe I'll cut a few of these real quick. So we can have a, actually get a little bowl here and put our garnish in to do that. So same thing. This would be our garnish for this. We start putting everything together. So I'm going to cut these a little thicker near the greens and then a little thinner down near the whites, so we have some of those set. Uh, myself, a little spice. We have some chilies there, so if you're not a spice person, maybe you're not gonna put the chilies in there. It could be different types of chilies. I'm gonna cut these a little bit thinner. Good flavor, good color, just some nice action. We'll kind of mix all those together. Maybe we'll put it in that bowl there. Uh, a little jalapeno, right, if you're a jalapeno fan as well. But the thing is, think about chilies that you like and different levels of heat, right? We we think about that, we think about different fermented sauces um, and items like this, whether you make it or you buy it, right? Same idea. So I can take a little jalapeno as well, and I can just slice it. And this, I'm not, I'm not going to go on the bias, I'm going to go real paper thin. You can see I'm just very careful with that knife. Just nice and thin is perfect like that. Just don't touch your eyes and everything. <laughs> so let's put that there. That looks good. And then I also have a little bit, I wrap that in pa uh, paper towels. We wrap it and then put it... A little bit of beautiful cilantro we have there as well for our garnish. And I have a little bit of fresh mint. So just delicious. I'm going I'm to put that the last second. So I'm going to put this back in here for right now. And this will be our garnishes. And we also have our fish sauce and our brown sugar to add to that. So to recap, for the pho, we have the broth working. We have our noodles, which are right now soaking and reconstituting, getting nice and fresh. For our chicken, we have our vegetables prepped with we'll just saute those, as well as we have our chicken marinating for that. Okay, so those first two things are kind of working. We're kind of going back and forth. So now I'm going to work on a little bit of a little vegetable maki roll, which to me is just delicious. So I left some of the stuff in packages. Um, I've already cooked our rice. This is a short grain rice. Okay, it's a sticky rice, short grain rice. And for this, it's always a ratio we talk about with professionals, no ratio. So it's one cup of uh, short grain rice or sushi rice to one and a quarter cups of liquid. So as long as you have that, you look great. So for instance, say you have two cups of raw rice, you'll need two and a half cups of liquid. So to that, I also added, I'll take these two things for you. I also added a little bit of some piece of kelp or seaweed and a little bit of handashi, which is kind of like a little, little bit of a, a dry uh, flavoring aspect of that. So we cooked it, we mixed it together, we steamed it, and when the steamer shut off, rice cooker shut off, I get about 20 minutes and I allowed that to sit there 
and allowed it to work and took it out. And traditionally, you would add the rice wine vinegar, seasoned rice wine vinegar, or you can make your own seasoned rice wine vinegar, add it to it, and I gently took a wooden spoon and I was stirring it. And classically, you would take a fan and you turn it nice and gentle. Because we're not trying to mash or smush the grains. We're going to keep them nice and light, but they are going to be sticky because of all that gluten in the rice. So we did that, cooled it down properly, and now it's in the bowl sitting there. We're also going to need a little bowl with some water to roll our stuff. Let's bring that out. Okay. And for this, we have our vegetables. So we have a cucumber. So I have a piece of the nori or this, this toasted seaweed, roasted seaweed. I'm going to take our cucumber. This is an English cucumber. And I'm going to kind of look at the shape. I'm going to cut it down just a little bit. And I'm going to slice it down the middle. Keep the skin on it. I can scoop out the middle, which we can do that pretty easily, right? Even though it's a seedless cucumber, you can still take some of that out. Take some of that out if you wish. So just like that, nice and easy, like so. And then I can take that and cut it into pieces like that. And all this stuff you could have prepared at time. You have your rice done. You could have your cucumber already ready to go. And I just cut one half, but it gives you a nice idea what that looks like. It just smells beautiful. Uh, we have some roasted pepper. So the peppers, we took the whole pepper, we washed them, and we charred them on the stove or on the stove or on the burner here. Then took a damp paper towel, wiped them off. There's a little bit of soil about char in them. I think the char gives great flavor. So I'm going to set that down. And again, you can have the rice already cooked. All these vegetables are already cut, cut and prepped up, ready to roll. So really at your house, if you're doing that, right, celebrating this wonderful Heritage Month, you can have all kinds of veggies for your guests or your family to do, and they kind of roll their own flavors, right? I could have had some portobello mushrooms. Uh, asparagus season is starting. We could have um, went ahead and blanched some asparagus and then grilled it on the grill, right? So good flavors. Portobello mushroom, roast them in the oven or put them on the grill. The same idea with that. They also have something. This is a little burdock, which is back here, and a little pickled daikon radish. So very, very good. I like, I like the pickled daikon radish kimchi style, so a little bit of spice to it. But this is nice because you can buy this too, and it's already already ready to go for you, already pre-cut, which makes it really nice. And burdock is kind of a unique color as well as flavor uh, profile as a plant. So we're going to open those up, hopefully get that set. I see our fuzz starting to come to a nice little simmer there, good action working. And we got these open. Almost open. <laughs> Maybe. There we go. Got it. Okay. So those are all set for us to go when we start. Um, for the mayonnaise, I'm just going to take a little bit of a little container, and we're just going to mix a little bit of some beautiful Japanese mayonnaise. So this is a, to me, this is a, I get no great little Japanese. Has different flavor than regular American mayonnaise. Um, has a couple different types of oils in there. There's so a soy, uh, soybean, and canola oil, as well as some other uh, vinegars and things. So. Gives a very unique flavor. So a little mayonnaise in here. And I could add a little bit of sriracha or another spicy thing. I have a little powdered wasabi. I'm going to use a little bit of a touch of powdered wasabi in there. We can borrow that spoon right there. There's no problem. Uh, thai chili paste also works really, really well. So it depends on the type of spice that you like. I think the, the wasabi powder gives a nice little essence to that. We'll set that back over here. And so we're going to get that kind of working. And we like to purchase wasabi powder because then we can use it in many applications and it lasts longer than purchasing just in the tube. Right, and we actually do that. We actually mix it with flour. I make like the sear scallops off in different dishes and even make the wasabi little paste as well, <laughs> of course. So there's some of that that are ready to go. I have a bamboo roller. I always roll this twice in plastic wrap. It keeps it nice and clean. I'm going to lay that flat. This is a little bit, uh, I put a little bag to keep it nice and correct, nice and crispy per se, but a little roasted seaweed. I like that roasted flavor. If you spy it and it doesn't say roasted, no problem at all. You can always gently, over a light, light flame, is roast it. So when you're looking at that, I look at it, you won't have the shinier side out, which is going to be this side compared to this side. So I'm going to lay it on, my, on the board here. I'm going to get this out of the way so I can keep going. Okay, so... As Michael said, he has his bamboo roller wrapped in plastic wrap. We have a little bit of water, and then he has his rice. So I'm going to go ahead and get this squared away. 
and we're gonna put this. So you notice I'm gonna leave a little gap up here and a little gap down here. Notice I'm not making it real thick. I'm gonna be real gentle with that. And to me, this is something that our children, we have adult children now, but even now they enjoyed it. We even did it for, um, we made it for New Year's Eve and those kind of things too. The reason I put the water on my hands is so that the rice, because the rice doesn't stick to it, and the rice also is cold. You can see it's not mushy, it's nice and beautiful. So again, one cup of raw rice to one and a cup quarters of liquid. Okay, so it's nice and even, nice and flat. I'm going to take a little bit of furikake, and we're going to put this nice little rice seasoning on there. It gives a nice little neat flavor. Just a little bit on there, it's just wonderful. You can also take a little bit of black and white sesame seeds. We could do it that way as well. An inside out roll is actually where you'd actually take it and flip it over and build it this way. But we're going to build it the more traditional way. So we have our mayonnaise, our wasabi mayonnaise, or you could use a spicy uh, Thai chili paste or a sriracha, whatever you wish to use. I like to put a little bit, that creaminess just, just, just gives some nice fun flavors to that as well. So let's do that. Perfect. Now I always like to put the cucumber down. I'm going to kind of press that cucumber into it. I'm kind of pressing it so it stays in there. Now we have our pickled daikon radish. Great color, great crunch, great flavor. And you notice how everything is lining up for Michael? Mm-hmm. I'm going to go ahead and lay peppers here. So think about color. I don't put the same color next to each other. So just nice beautiful color like And like so. Michael said, asparagus is perfect and welcome to different um, vegetables that you want to put in. Peanuts, a yum. crunch in there as well. And sometimes Michael takes the peanuts and puts them in the food processor with a little cilantro for um, something different when he does uh, inside out roll. Okay, so little that. So now I'm going to take a little mescaline greens on there. And we could put those in kind of a rice vinegar vinaigrette. But I think this is kind of nice. I'm going to wrap my hands up here. Take that roll over, kind of press, and bring that right over top. And I'm going to make a nice cylinder. Obviously, I'm kind of pressing with my hands. Take it back. I'm going to take a little more water. And this I'm going to rub just, just a little bit on there. It's going to help seal that together. And then I'm going to push that ahead. Push it down. Twist it and press in the ends. I can always put a little more rice in there if I have to. So I'm kind of push my hand and blow in that circle. It's a nice cylinder. And when I'm done, we have a nice little log. And wherever the seal is, is where you want to have that on the bottom. Okay, so there's that one. So now, just for fun, I have our plate over here. And what's on our plate? So we have a little bit of beautiful pickled ginger, which is great to have after eating some of this. And I have a little bit of red shisu leaves as well, so it's some great flavor. And then for our sauce, we have a little bit of raspberry preserve and some of that rice uh, seasoned rice wine vinegar. And this is all kind of by taste. I'm going to put a little, so you got sweetness with the raspberry and the flavor of the raspberry. I also have just a little touch of soy sauce, and I think it makes it a little salty. So you have some sweet. You have some salty, you have some acid there, so we're kind of looking, and the soy also gives some saltiness and also umami. So it kind of covers about all five taste profiles. So this you'd go by taste. And sometimes it's uh, the vinegar, wasabi powder, mm -hmm. and then um, some raspberry, or sometimes we use a little bit of horseradish. Yeah, very, very apricot dipping sauce, very same, yes. same kind of process. I think that's beautiful just like that. So see how wonderful we're all set, ready to go. And again, this is the Japanese mayonnaise that Michael used. Japanese mayonnaise. And then we have our bamboo steamer here. This is the kelp that Michael was talking about. We have the different oils that you can use. Your rice wine vinegar. Your soy. And then I want to show you, this is the cane vinegar Michael was talking about. And then, of course, who doesn't love a little sriracha. Okay, so I'm going to wet my knife, and I could use a slicing knife, but I'll use a chef knife instead. So I'm going to take it, and I have my seal, right, where I sealed that on the bottom, okay? Ideally is to roll these, let these sit a little, maybe a couple, maybe 20 minutes, half an hour before. I'm going to go ahead and push my nice little square shape, or you make a rounded one, this is kind of a square shape. I'm going to cut that little piece off. You have to hit that with the steel. So you know what the steel. Do you where the slicing knife is? Any idea? Hit this just real quick. This needs just a little nice sharp knife. So let's go ahead and go back in. There we go. 
that's what our children call a snack. Everybody comes around when Dad is making sushi. They're and we always... could also put, you know, uh, shrimp, cook, sh uh, cook and chilled shrimp in here. We could use imitation crab or fresh crab with that. We could put lobster in there. We could do a little bit of a little tuna, right? A little raw tuna would be delicious in there as well. So it all depends on you. Um, I like the vegetarian version, right? I mean, to me, it's just a lot of good flavor with that as well. And just you can see, just nice and easy, nice clean cuts. We call those two pieces there a snack. I'm going to put them over <laughs> there, maybe a snack later. And then we have this beautiful plate. We can take a look inside. But look at all of that fun, delicious stuff. Looks beautiful. And again, we ha we host uh, friends over, and it's a lot of fun when everybody's making their own sushi, and they get to roll and try, and you know, get the kids involved, and everything. You'll be surprised. There we go. And everybody can kind of roll their own. So I think that's just beautiful. Oh, it does look beautiful, Michael. All right. Okay, well, guess what? I <laughs> smell the wonderful. Pho, yeah, the pho is right, about ready to roll there. I'm going to go ahead and kind of jump back on the chicken dish. Uh-oh, that's my cue. Let me get that uh, chicken out of the fridge for you, okay? Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and make my sauce real quick, because remember for that sauce on that page two of that chicken bowl, we have a little bit of a uh, little sauce, right? A little sauce outing sauce for that. So I'm going to take a little bowl and it has some red vinegar. It has a large uh, red onion dice. I'm going to take an onion real quick. I'm going to slice that onion. So hang loose just a quick second oh, on that okay. chicken. I'm going to make that sauce because i got to get that ready for the bowl. Not a problem. So cut kind of onion in half. We're going to cut that small dice about a quarter inch. I'm going to go into it, go into it, go into it. So you notice the onion's on the edge of the board, so that way I can go into it real easy. Now come back, quarter inch. Now you can see because we sharpened that knife, how beautiful that is. Nice clean cuts. And this is basically a pretty straightforward. We're gonna go ahead and slice that now. So we're gonna go three directions, the side, up and down, or vertical, horizontal. And we're gonna do a beautiful little dice there. And just so you know, we make a batch of this and we keep it in our fridge. Mm -hmm. And that's the wonderful thing about this. You can go ahead, make it, have it in your fridge. We use it, you know, if you're just heating up some rice and, you know, something a little different. So that's our rice vinegar we just added. We have mm -hmm. a little bit of garlic we're going to put in there as well. And then I have some different types of ch uh, peppers there, right? So we have some great little uh, scotch bonnet peppers. I can probably still, don't, uh, probably sneak a little pepper. I got just a little bit of that red pepper left. Let's sneak a little <laughs> bit of that one in there too. So we'll take the garlic, we'll cut the little ends off the garlic real quick and get those ready. Our pho is simmering just beautifully, nice and gentle. We're not trying, we're not trying to reduce it, we're just trying to infuse that flavor, okay? So for the garlic, we're just gonna, it says pounded, we're just gonna gently mince it a little bit, just a real rough chop, get some great flavor going in there as well. So just kind of a once or twice through, like so. Perfect. Just maybe one more shot. Boy, it smells good, that garlic. Pick that up. So red onions in there. We got our vinegar in there as well. I'm going to take our chilies. It says sliced for that. Our scotch are minced and sliced. So I'm going to go ahead and slice this one. I'm going to cut, cut it down the middle. I'm going to take the seeds out of it, like so. So it's a little easier to work with. And again, it definitely depends on you. We've had this many different versions where it's chunky, where you could tell that people put it in a food processor. We've had it where it's diced small, sometimes it's green chilies, and no scotch bonnet in it. So there's many different versions of this, but Michael and I, um, this is one that we enjoy. So I'm about the sugar, and I'm just going to slice these up real thin. We can, all, we can also, we can come back and chop them or mince them, depends on you. Uh, take away some of the heat, you could take away those seeds, it all depends on what you want to do. I'm just going to run a knife through it a little bit, I love the color. And so we'll mince those up like that looks good. And then for the other pepper, we can go ahead and come back and do that nice little thin slices. So we're going to mix that in a bowl there. So we have the vinegar, we have the chilies, we have our onion, we have garlic. I'm going to put a little fresh pepper on there. We've already added our um, sugar to that. And I'm going to put some freshly ground black pepper. And a little salt. And that's good to go. Have the vegetables, Susan. Oh, that's my turn. 
Get that chicken going, actually. Well, how about I give you the chicken first so we can get that going. Okay, I'm going to move that thaw back here real quick. Perfect. And get this little bowl here going. So for the for this, they want us to take it and we're going to add the uh, juice to make a little sauce with that. So let's take the sauce out. Can you strain that pho for me, please, Sue? Yes, I would love to. So I'm going to go ahead and use my strainer, and I am going to strain this beautiful broth. Yeah, the pho. Yeah, get that strain. I'm going to get the pan going here for our, uh, this will be for our bowl. Pan's getting nice and hot. I'm going to add some of our chicken. If I will do it all, let's just do a little bit of that chicken. We'll keep that chilled. Mmm. Smells so good. Okay, so we have our sauce off to the side. Okay. So this is for our bowl. We got our chicken marinating. We got our veggies for that over there. Okay, great. Yep, here's our veggies. So our pan's reducing, so we got that. Okay. And I'll need to get our rice squared away in a second. Rice. That rice looking pretty good. You want to put rice in some bowl? Uh, actually, for the pho, so we'll I'll actually need to do a little stir fry rice is what we need to do. Can I have the, the wok? Is that possible? Yes. Here you go. Let's put that up there. For the There's the wok. And the rice, Michael, is on your side. Okay. There you go. So. Over in the corner. So we made a little garlic oil there. So for the rice, for our Philippine style chicken and broccoli barbecue bowl. So we have our chicken cooking here. I have our pan. I took some garlic. I toasted it. Put a little oil in it. Got that going in that pan, nice and hot, and a little fried rice. So we'll put our rice in here as well. Pan's nice and hot, now I can hear it. I'm gonna come over and watch you stir fry. Is that okay, Michael? You bet. Yum. Okay, now the great thing is we're using jasmine rice today um, for this, and uh, you have it cooked, it's hot, ready to go. Our chicken is cooking back here in the pan, and that's why Michael wanted it to be, you know, smaller pieces and everything. And then don't forget, if you forgot, look how pretty this looks. And again, blanching your broccoli um, ahead of time just makes such a beautiful uh, color, flavor. And then, here is his sauce. Look at all these great colors. That's the sauce salad. Okay, so that's working as well. Our rice in here making some nice noise there. We're getting that nice and fried. And we're not going to add an egg too. We're going to put a little egg on top of it. So I'm going to get this going. That chicken's just about ready. I'm going to go ahead and throw a little peppers in there. Here we go. And a little bit of our garnish. Peppers, carrots. A little broccoli in there. And some of our peas. Rice is popping. Doing good. Rice is popping. Look at this. Yum. Yum. <laughs> Sorry, we've been married too long together. So we have our beautiful rice. Got to keep a couple of scallions. All right, so our rice looks beautiful. You can hear it pop everywhere. I'm going to put a little rice to the bottom of our bowl here. Nice little rice there. In the meantime, I'm going to put a little oil in our pan. And when Michael is talking oil, we're using, um, some people like to use peanut oil. We use, uh, for the masses, um, a canola or a grapeseed oil. And Michael is going to go ahead and fry When the pan's warm, we're going to do a little egg over easy there. That's the goal. Yes. And then look, we have the stir fry. And that's why you want to have your vegetables done. Here's our beautiful garlic uh, rice. All right, that's looking really good. I'm going to go ahead and put this okay. inside. And we need a few scallions here in a few seconds. We'll come back to that egg. You see that ready to go? We actually don't want the bubbling. We're going to slow that down. Put the yolk closest to me, and we're going to one, two, three, and flip it over just like that. Nice and quick. Okay. Okay, so we have that there, so I think I'm missing is going to be, uh, we'll put a little sauce on there in just a quick second, but I'm going to go ahead and put that egg, right, so we got everything on there, we'll put the, let's make sure the egg isn't sticking, there we go, <laughs> we're going to slide that egg just right on top like that. Oh, yum! And can I have my scallions, or whatever, they're done. okay, I'll slice them here, that's perfect. 
just a little bit of onion there, like it fell from the sky. And we'll take some of our sauce and sauce. And just a little bit. Just some good action. Oh, that smells good. Beautiful. Okay. Wonderful. Oh my gosh. Two dishes done. All right, so I'm going to take a look. I need to add, so the broth you strained, correct? Yes. So I'm going to go ahead and I have that broth here. I'm going to add our brown sugar into that one as well as our fish sauce. I will say we did boil that, just so you know, this is the marinade, it's been boiled so it is safe. We can always put a little bit of that in there as well, so a little broth with the, uh, the barbecue chicken and broccoli bowl. And then finally, we have our broth. I'm going to go ahead and take that, get this back on the stove just for a quick second. Okay. So we have our soy in there. And this is our beef that has been thinly sliced that we purchased at our Asian store. We have our noodles, and I want to show you the package that I purchased. This package here, you can go ahead, it's almost like an instant rice noodle. So you can see we have our hot noodles. And our beef, I'm just going to take it, and I can cut maybe cut into some strips. Yes. Kind of like that, lay those in there. And that hot broth, which has that fish sauce in there, as well as some brown sugar, so you got good saltiness, you got good umami in there. We're going to lay those like so. We have our... Okay, so we're going to go ahead and take our broth real quick. Okay, so when you have this, our noodles are hot, our beef, as you saw, was thinly sliced. And this hot juice or hot broth, this beef broth with the ginger and the onions, are actually going to cook it. So I'm going to put, maybe I'll just pour a little bit, be a little faster for us today. You can share that with a friend or something there. Yes, and you want to make sure that it covers the meat. And the little scallions over there. Oh, yum. And Jalapenos. Bean sprouts. Bean sprouts. And then don't forget, we have that beautiful cilantro and mint that you can garnish with. And then we like to serve um, some lime wedges. You can um, serve those on a fun little plate. Just real quick. And I'll just put one like that just to, to put a couple on there. Perfect. Okay, I'm gonna pop one on the side here as well. And you can see how that beef is actually cooking right in there. So if you're a medium rare person or medium, it'll be beautiful. Let it sit for a few minutes like that. If you like it more well done, you can quickly sear it in that pan and do it. But we have the beautiful vegetable maki roll with some great flavors in there, great textures, great raspberry dipping sauce, a little bit of pickled ginger to have with that. Wasabi mixed with that Japanese mayonnaise, delicious. We also have our uh, broccoli and chicken bowl and finally our beef pho. Uh, I hope you enjoy our day with us, our evening, with our celebrating our Asian Pacific Islander uh, American Heritage Month. Thank you for joining us. Good cooking to everyone. Please enjoy. I'm exhausted. <laughs> Michael, that was great. We really, truly enjoyed seeing you cook. And there are some wonderful comments here that you're a great teacher and just a great job and in such a short time pulling it all together. Um, we do have a few questions. Sure. So one of those questions is, um, what is the black banana ketchup? So it is a, so you can purchase that in a jar. We actually like, so this is one of the dishes I do in my, that I did in my, this semester with my students with a, our fast casual class. And so, the recipe, actually the recipe, and I can send that to you as well. It's it's easier to purchase that, of course, but it's kind of a combination of dark uh, dark raisins, onions, garlic, tomato paste, cider vinegar, bananas, extremely ripe, uh, cut into chunks, a little bit of water in there, dark brown sugar, kosher salt, cayenne pepper, golden syrup, ground all spices, ground cinnamon, nutmeg, freshly grated, fresh ground pepper, some cloves, and just for fun, a little dark rum as well. 
And so it's a mixture that you'll put together, you'll puree it, and then you actually, actually reduce that down like you would do any kind of mango ketchup or tomato ketchup. And it's easier to buy it, but for myself or with our students, our culinary students, you know, we like convenience. We, as, as people, we like convenience and those kind of items as well. But for culinary wise, with students wise, I think it's interesting to see what great Filipino style this ketchup is. And so to me, it's it's uh, different styles. And um, I like making it from scratch, um, but it was good for our students to learn that and also learning knife skill and things like that too. But, you know, if I'm making this skin, there's a lot of things to do. If you can save time and convenience, you buy it in those kind of items too. So good flavor. And it's nice with that marinade with that Sprite or 7-Up in there, the soy sauce. So you think about the sweetness and the bitter and the sour and the umami, all that's penetrating into those thighs. Now, if you're not a thigh, boneless thigh person, feel free to use a chicken breast. That's fine, whatever you wish to use. Um, I like the thighs because they hold the moisture, but in that marinade, which we use eventually as a sauce, um, I think it gives a lot of great flavor for that. Cool, thank you. And kind of along that same line, um, and I'm pretty sure, but I want to double check with you, um, are the Asian seasonings that you used while you were cooking today, are they all spelled out really clearly in the recipes that you have? Yes, yep, yep. And you know, and, and with and not a surprise to anyone, but when we look at savory cooking, right? people and some people say, I don't like pastries and baking, all these kind of things. And with and I like both sides for different reasons. I like the pastries and baking and pastries because it's more of an exact science, right? So it's very front loaded. And so that means if you're making croissants or Danish or breads or a, a tarte, what are those kind of things? You have to, you make that and you bake it and cook that or prepare that. And then it's done, right? It's hands off. Once it goes down, you got to take care of it, cook that properly, which is great. A lot of people also like the savory side and like some of the things that we used in the demonstration as well as in the recipe. It's very flexible, right? With that vegetable maki roll, if you're not a mushroom fan, if you're not a cucumber fan, adjust that and make it sure. I've even done a vegetable sushi, I'm sorry, a dessert one, where my liquid, instead of using broth or water for that, I actually used mango juice. So I've done that with passion fruit juice. So the same ratio, cook that, and then put slices of mango, slices of watermelon in there. So it's kind of a twist on a classic uh, roll, but it made it more uh, pastry-wise as well. So to me, I think it's, it's it's changing those, adjusting those flavors or heat per se, as uh, what you like to use, strength of heat. Cool, thank you. So going back to the banana ketchup, is there a particular brand that you think is better than others? No, not offhand. I mean, they're all pretty, pretty streamlined. It's, it's, it's pretty streamlined as far as flavor wise, taste wise. And you know, and, you know it, it's just like a movie, right? Everyone likes the same movie or same TV show. Try, you know, they're not overly expensive. So try a couple and see which ones you like. It's like spicy hot sauces or fermented sauces as well. Um, or apples, right? D tasting different apples. Some people like different ones. So brand name, not too much, but as long as you go in the ethnic area per se for those things. And, you know, nowadays with Amazon, and it, it, it's wonderful that the products that we can get and items we can get. Great. That's wonderful. Now, if anyone else has some more questions, I still have one left to do. Make sure you put it in the, the chat or in the Q&A, either is fine. So Michael, one of the questions I have is, do you have any other teaching videos that are available? Because many people here found all of your tips that you put in there, that they really were learning a lot and it was really helpful. Oh, good, good, good. Um, per se, not, not really, not, not too much like that. Uh, myself teaching at the college full-time like that, it's, it's like every day I'm doing something. And we did do a few hands-on like knife skill things as far as fabrication of poultry. We did fabrication of fish and those kind of things that we do for our students. Um, the other chef medics, well, you saw my, briefly saw my wife, Susan there. She is an adjunct teacher and she does um, a lot of different um, local, and this is Chicago and per se, libraries and things like that. But if you, I'm sure if you got in touch with some libraries, they do, they're doing some live ones, but they're also doing things like this, which are people who are per se uncomfortable with coming to the library and, and also live in different places. Um, they can also do those, uh, locate those libraries, and you can do the Zoom kind of what we're doing this evening. And so she does those as well, which is kind of fun. Cool. Well, there was a comment. They really loved the husband wife interaction in um, the video. So that was really great to see that play out there. Um, another question we have is Do you have a cookbook that people buy? I do not have. I used to, so we, I was in the process about myself background per se is I used to own a fine dining French restaurant and so through that French restaurant we were working on a cookbook and never it's still in the process and you know it, it, after working with students for a number of years 
um, always continuing looking to possibly do something like that. I always kind of back to the husband wife thing for us, my wife and I worked together at our restaurant eight years. And I was there for many years before she came and joined me when we purchased the restaurant. Um, but, you know, it, it was always kind of, I always kind of make a little joke with uh, with students is like, we're celebrating our 28th year. My wife said it's been the best four years of her life. So just, I'm not sure the other 24, I'm not sure about, but four years, no, but we get along, we get along very, very well in the kitchen we have fun. And so for us is, you know, it, it's the things where we both take the lead on different aspects of those kind of items. And, you know, the biggest thing, and it kind of falls back to, you know, any cuisine, but we're celebrating, you know, and celebrating the Asian, the Pacific Islander in this month, Heritage Month, but it's really that passion in, in your cooking. And I think that really shows whether you're a foodie, whether you like just to, if you're a professional, or you just enjoy cooking for family and friends. I think that really translates into the food. And that's one thing I can't say enough, even today to my students today, I was saying, you know, invest in yourself and be engaged and find those ingredients. And doesn't make everything from scratch, right? Um, you know, we you can buy, you know, mayonnaise. We can make our own. You can buy them, the ketchup, those kind of items as well. What do you want to tackle? Now, I did a lot of things in these three recipes, but there's things that you can do ahead of time, like you know, the maki roll. Have all the vegetables prepped and think about what you like. What does like I always say when I go to a store, I'm going to make a dessert. Or I'm going to make a, a tart. I don't know what flavor. I let the store, the farmer's market, or my garden, or my neighbor's garden, right, whatever the case may be, um, that tells me, right, so I saw some beautiful um, plums today, some black plums, and I walked in the store, I could smell them when you walk in the store, it's a good smell, right, there's good smells and bad smells, but good smells, so I bought about two, three pounds of plum tarts, I'm going to make a, a, a plums to make a plum tart tomorrow, but when you go in the store, I'm going to make a fruit salad for the summer, right, now, these 90 degree days. Do you smell the cantaloupe? Can you smell the watermelon? Can you smell the strawberries, right? It's those things that are very simple, but taking the best ingredients at the peak of, of flavor and taste will come through and your passion making those items. And it could be very, you know, a simple five ingredient recipe compared to a 12 ingredient or 20 ingredient. Those kind of, really matter. It's more about the ingredients and following certain method and techniques. And, you know, I think the passion that one has, whether professional or just a person who enjoys cooking, uh, on, on many levels, really shines through. And I was talking, I have some asparagus growing in my garden. My rhubarb is probably two feet tall right now. And so I come from central Illinois. So I actually went to my parents' family farm this weekend to go mushroom, well, go mushroom looking. I shouldn't say hunting because I, it's like when you go fishing. I try to catch fish, but I don't always catch fish. So I'm hoping to find morels. But it's again, it's what nature provides for us. In the fall, I forage for hen of the woods or chicken of the woods mushrooms, or even puff balls. I look like volleyballs out in the woods. And so it, it's kind of living off the land and what grows in around us and, and doing that. And I saw a lot of this with, with the pandemic. And you know, it's my first pandemic. I'm learning about all kinds of things being my first pandemic. But how people started cooking and baking and growing gardens. It could be just simple things as pots, but and those fresh tomatoes or chiles or beans or lettuces and really taking pride in that. And I think, and even starting to preserve and can those items. And I think it's, it means a lot. And so, um, you know, even, you know, people like to give things things. And, you know, for, for us is, you know, making homemade pickles or making something from your garden, something you found at the farmer's market and preserving, making. And so I give that to our neighbors, right? It's rather than giving a, here's a, something you bought at the store. I think it means more, here's a preserve that we made, a pear, pear marmalade, or here's a, here's a tomato chutney or tomato compost or something like that. I think it means a lot more. Um, I made uh, some pastrami. I had smoked it. I, I had cured it. I had, I had uh, smoked it. Then I had slow cooked it. And I shared that with some neighbors and stuff like that. And so to me, it's always a lot of fun. And we go up, there's a group of gentlemen that go up to northern Wisconsin fishing. There's about six of us, six, seven of us. And about four of us are, sh are shops by trade, country clubs, restaurants, and educators, and those kind of things. And the other three call themselves lucky. Because when we get up there, we'll cook. It's like it's like Iron Chef on steroids. We're having fun. We're even nutty. Last time we went up, uh, we took a little burner and I made we made Rubens on the pontoon boat while we were fishing. And so I had homemade marble rye, homemade corned beef, and all these kind of things. And then we caught some beautiful fish. We actually flayed it there real quick, and I sautéed it. And I mean, just it, it, as as everyone knows, the fresher that you fillet that fish and cook that fish from when it's been been gathered per se. The flavor evolves and changes, not, and not always in a positive way, but the flavor is very different from a fish that's been cooked once from being caught within a couple hours 
compared to days as it goes by. And I think that's always kind of interesting to really taking what we have and look at what's grown here, but what's available at the store from different jarred and canned and frozen and fresh. And really, and I always kind of tell my, push my students to say, hey, when you go to the store with your family or friends, buy something, not don't spend a ton of money, but buy something you would not normally buy. And nowadays with the internet research that find a, find a fun recipe or a fun little dish or a salad or a side dish or an entree with that and, and make it and have some fun with it. And, and to me, that's what life's about, right? Life is very short. And when we see that a lot with COVID, how uh, people have passed away and people have been sick and all those kind of things. And it really kind of takes you to see your family, to your friends, as well as your neighbors and, and bring community together. So I guess that's a long answer to a short question, but. No, that was great. And it really ties nicely back to what you were saying is that a lot of these recipes and where different um, places had their, their food source came very locally from that. Sure. And sometimes we forget that because we have such a global economy and right. that a lot of our local uh, stuff we can use right here to help enhance right. our foods. Yeah, that farm, that farm to table before it was farm to table, right? Or field to table or ocean to table or sea to table. Yes. Wonderful. Well, Michael, I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I truly learned a lot of really good tips and great ideas. I can't wait to go try these recipes, as I'm sure several of our viewers can't. And I want to thank all everyone who's in attendance tonight for joining us. We hope to see Michael. Thanks again. Thank you. I forgot to tell you, push F12 on the computer and the smell of vision works. I forgot to mention that during the video, but but have awesome. some fun and, and you know and, and cook and enjoy yourself right that's what life's about and you know bringing food together bringing people together and to me that's what it's, it's, every day is, is a great day enjoy some great food and different ethnic cuisines and take advantage of it but i thank everyone for spending some a little bit of time with us and uh hope you had some fun and um enjoyed yourself and hope you try these and if you come to chicago land and you're near college of the page come see us uh, at the right we have a restaurant there as well for the school so thank you yeah.